We have seen Nerd Roddick and the Critical Drinker on Piers Morgan, which is a great feeling anytime you see somebody that runs in the same sort of sphere as us, that has the same end goal. It adds a little bit of legitimacy to what we're trying to do on those mainstream platforms. And now we can add Jeremy himself, D-Day Cobra, to the list. Welcome back to Words of Paradise. I'm your host, Land Idol. And yes, our boy Jeremy got on Piers Morgan. And uh, I haven't seen this yet, but I figured let's go over and see what he had to say, see how the topic of conversation flows, and what comes of it. So we're going to go into this before we do hit that subscribe button. I'm a nerdy news channel. I cover nerdy news every day. And mad props to you, Jeremy. Let's go. Joker was a box office smash and a cultural phenomenon, raking in more than a billion dollars and landing Joachim Felix an Oscar. Sequel by... Say his name again, Piers. Joachim Phoenix. <laughs> the same leading man, the same director, is heading the way of the Titanic and not the incredibly successful DiCaprio movie but the actual boat, which resides firmly at the bottom of the ocean. The pretentiously named Joker Folia 2, hereafter known as Joker 2, is one of the biggest commercial and critical catastrophes in Hollywood history. So what's gone wrong? A hardcore fans said a Joker is broker because it became woker. Joining me to debate all this. Uh, is jo Look, I haven't seen Joker 2. I got no interest in seeing Joker 2, uh, mainly because I'm going to be real. As you guys know, I don't like the first one. I think the first Joker movie kind of sucks, so I don't got any interest in seeing the second one. That being said, look, our, our crew, our group, the, the folks that make content like me are kind of the first to call everything woke. Uh, and yet, I actually haven't heard that about Joker 2. I've just heard it's bad. Is, is, is it woke? I don't, I, again, I don't know. I'm never going to see it, but not for any sort of wokeness reasons. This and the fallout, uncensored contributor Esther Kraku, author of The Case for Cancel Culture, Ernest Owens, chief film critic for Variety, Peter DeBruge, and the CEO of YouTube network Geeks and Gamers, Jeremy Primer. Welcome to all of you. Jeremy, let me start with you. For people who've not seen this sequel, but may be surprised by what a failure it seems, seems to have been. And it... To be fair, even if you haven't seen the sequel, this shouldn't be a surprise. Really has in box office terms been an absolute bust. What mm -hmm. has gone wrong here? Do you think? I mean, ultimately, it just represents Hollywood in a nutshell. They hate their fans. They despise their fans. And if you watch this movie, it was a direct shot at all of the fans that supported the first film. And it wasn't just the fans that supported the first film. It was normies. It was regular people. It it was elevated to the highest grossing rated R film of all time because of word of mouth, because you have to get normies involved at that point in time for a film to be that successful. So, so there is no one type of fan that represented the Joker in 2019 success, but in Hollywood's terms, they had to let those fans know, we don't like you and we're going to destroy everything that you loved. There's a, uh, there was a review. So uh, that, that's a real common sentiment that uh, the film was just straight up antagonistic to the fans of the first one. Again, I haven't seen it. I don't know if it's true. You can let me know in the comments down below if it's true. Uh, but even even if that is the case, um, or even if that's not the case, I should say, let, let's say that it wasn't antagonistic towards the fans. It still doesn't inherently mean to be a good movie that would make a lot of money. Uh, there, there was so much going against this film. And the, the idea that it was going to flop was all over the internet, months and months before it came out, before we knew it took shots at the fans, if that's what it did. You in the London Metro, which said the decision to make Joker 2 was a takedown of the incel-celebrated Joker 1 and gave a middle finger to the right-wing online edgelords and was a bold, daring move by the filmmakers. A, a is that characterization correct, do you think? Um, and B, what do you think about that? No, I mean, it's just, um, it, it is a cultural problem within Hollywood. I don't think that, I, I think that those those uh, words are being, uh, you know, used in Hollywood on a consistent basis across the board. But we've seen this from whether it's Star Wars, whether it's Marvel, whether it's other things that have a huge fan base and a huge support system. They want to cater to that audience and that audience will give them a platform and then they will abandon that audience once they have the platform that they built off of it. We've seen it time and time again. I mean, you've got situations with the Joker. The first film had a $50 million budget. The second film had a $200 million budget. Clearly, you were wanting that same... Can we just talk for a moment about how Jeremy got the 03 TMNT going on in that background there and how that is just the most base thing about all this? Like, just a, look, the 87 Turtles are my favorite. I grew up with them and whatnot. That was my first Turtles. But the 03 cartoon is objectively the best. It's the closest to the comics. Just mad props. Sorry, continue, Jeremy. Audience to go support your movie. 
But in reality, not only did they not support it at all, the normies didn't either. Usually when we see a film um, that has a huge amount of success, the follow-up film, whether it's good or not, usually sees a huge bump in the opening weekend and a massive drop on the second weekend if it's not good. We didn't even see the huge bump in opening weekend. No one was interested in this movie. Average people, normies, hardcore fans, no one wanted a follow-up to this film. It was a one-off. It should have been left at that. But they decided to take this as an opportunity to disrespect everybody. All right, Peter. Um, you know, I, I would took two of my sons to go and see the uh, Top Gun Maverick sequels, the original Top Gun, because Top Gun was one of my all-time favorite films. And I went with quite a sense of apprehension about whether it was going to try and change everything. But in fact, it was a brilliant just modern reincarnation of the original one in terms of the way it, it, was, uh, it was made. And I loved it. Uh, it seems to me the big problem that people have with the Joker 2 is it's almost like a rejection on camera of what the first one stood for. But you said um, that it struck a nerve with you, not in a good way, the first movie, by transforming the beloved Batman villain into a poster boy for incels everywhere. I feared we could go down the Scarface route as a fictive role model for sick minds. I mean, pretty strong words, but do you think that was the view shared by the makers of the second one in the sense that we've got a we've got a reverse course here you know yeah he said peter so i assume he wasn't talking to the black dude because peter ain't exactly a black dude name but yeah white white guy's about to open his mouth and i mean just look at him homie looks like the old man from up when he was young but like uh i don't, I don't know like, all right so he's, he's gonna be full of soy and nothing. If the moment you're calling Joker an incel film, like, no, it was just a bad film. It was a bad film that a bunch of people bought into the hype of, so whatever. Uh, th this is the type of individual that's going to be so politically minded, everything's going to be about politics, Tim, even when there's not politics in anything, because that's what they absolutely need for that level of validation. But those are just my speculations. Let's see what he actually has to say. You know, it's hard for me to get into Todd Phillips' mind. It does really feel like kind of a perverse move to have basically taken everything that a certain kind of moviegoer, uh, usually the kind of moviegoer that goes to superhero movies and embraces them. Now, Joker was never a traditional superhero movie. My kind of argument or take on it is that it was this intended to be empathetic portrait of a, of a man with abuse issues, mental health issues, and that many of us read as an incel, uh, kind of... In that many of us read as an incel. Look... Why? I, like, like, I get it. He's, he, I guess he technically actually was an incel. I, like, but looking at the character and whatnot, um, he's, I bet he had never had sex or, 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 or maybe the sex he had was uh, probably non-consensual by some sort of parent or whatever. Uh, but the point is, that's not how incels, like, work in real life. It's still a fictional movie. And if you want to, like, apply this comic book character of the Joker to modern day incels, like, that's such a leap in uh, superhero drag. It wasn't the same Joker we'd ever seen before. His villainy was nothing like, you know, what we'd seen in the... Super, super, superhero drag is such a weird sense. I, I didn't even have a comment for it. It's just, I, was, I figured there'd be someone in the comments like, how can you not comment on that? Here's, here's the comment. That's a retarded sentence. The comics, and in a way, the billion dollar success seemed to be a response to that kind of high concept idea. Now here, the the villains of the movie, it's not Joker, it's the it's the characters who love him. You know, Harley Quinn is basically his number one fan, and he realizes that uh, she's not who she represents herself as, but rather uh, is just a groupie. And you know, the toward the end of the movie, without spoiling things, he's basically confronted with his fans and rejects them, even when he reassumes his kind of Joker persona. He's doing it uh, as a rejection of the violence that's expected of him. The only okay, I haven't seen this movie, but uh, well, holy shit, that sounds absolutely retarded. In that instance, you know what? Maybe it's true. Maybe maybe people like Jeremy and whatnot aren't reading into this too much. Maybe this movie is actually a, a, a thinly veiled disguise that everyone can see through as a slap in the face of the people that liked the first one, which is wild because the first one it made over a billion dollars. It's not as if everyone that went and saw it is going to be some sort of white supremacist or, or, or right wing or whatnot. Like, no, there, you got to have one of the two. Either those are a small minority, and uh, you know, it, it, there's not actually that many fans out there like that, or 
No, there actually are a whole, whole lot of us that are just normal and you don't understand which, you know, what normal is in your Hollywood bubble. But you're going to have to pick one. The only violence that happens in the movie, like the musical numbers, is happening in kind of a fantasy uh, in his headspace, but not actually in the movie. And, uh, and so you've got a movie that's a musical that doesn't give you the violence, that doesn't give you the Joker, or that, you know, he essentially rejects this. So uh, in a way, it felt like perhaps Todd Phillips was listening to his critics, people like me who thought that that first movie, I don't think... Let's say that's true. Let's say Todd Phillips was listening to the, the critics. Why would you listen to the critics about a movie that fans helped get over the Billy mark? That doesn't make sense. Is Todd Phillips truly that retarded? I mean, he made Joker 2, so he might be. We were the majority. There was a billion dollar proof that people loved this movie. But there were those of us who were reminded of the Aurora shootings, who felt triggered or, or you know, as if he was deliberately... Did this bitch really just say this movie reminded us of the Aurora shootings and we were triggered? Bro, get that weak shit out of here. I hope Jeremy is given the chance to just roast this dude. Playing with a character who had been associated with actual real-world copycat violence and of a certain demographic, and that he was... He was never glorifying this character, but he was presenting a portrait that allowed it to be read that way. And to me, it's the rare movie. Anyone can read anything any way they look into it hard enough. At no point in the Joker was the Joker glorified. If anything, the Joker sort of like skates on thin ice when it comes to like the, the mental health aspect. It's like, hey, mental health problems exist. And it doesn't give any sort of answers or anything. It's just sort of like, like, it's a really lazy movie when we want to talk about, oh, that deep mental health messaging. But again, that's a different story. Whatever. I felt, the first movie, that uh, the world was worse off for having exist. Really? You know, like, I... Uh, I mean, it seems, it seems to me, look, I, I thought the first movie was fantastic. Um, interestingly, if he did listen to critics like you, then clearly he's made a massive strategic mistake, isn't he? No disrespect to you. I know you're very good at what you do, but clearly taking the movie in the direction he's taken it by rejecting the original Joker, he's also had the audience reject the movie in spectacular fashion. It's been a humongously I, bad call, wasn't it? I also don't think Todd Phillips is the kind of person to listen to his critics in the sense of, like, to take notes from them. I think he's someone who responds to them. There's proof of that in The Hangover 3, which kind of ends with uh, them waking up kind of with a third hangover. And that's a response to critics of the second movie who said, this would never happen a second time. How do you expect us to believe this? You know, it's basically... I... How self-aware do we think this dude is? Because, like, when when he said... When Peter said, oh, well, it seems like Todd Phil made a massive mistake, it sounded like Peter over here went, agreed. But now he's, like, saying, like, oh, well, I don't know if... if Todd Phillips listens to the critics per se. Like, I don't know, he seems like he's just using a lot of weasel words to, to not put the blame on, on anyone. And just like, hey, look at me, I'm up here as Morgan. Basically a big uh, middle finger extended toward them. And so I think there's a complicated uh, reaction here where uh, he's trying to be responsible. He's trying to be original. He's trying to be provocative. And he's losing every one of the people who might have a vested interest in this movie along the way, okay. making a movie for no one. Let, let me bring it up. And he didn't I mean, want to. He didn't want to make the movie. By the way, he did not want to make a sequel. It's right. that Warner Brothers backed up the Brinks truck and forced his hand, so he took this mm -hmm. as an opportunity. I think. Anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, I think. I, I, I look. That was uh, Jeremy is being so professional on here. Like, like this is so antithetical to what we normally see of him on his channel. Like, like he's still Jeremy, but he's a much more like. All right. I'm out here representing something. I'm out here representing myself. I'm out here representing geeks and gamers. Maybe to some extent, I'm out here representing this sort of movement to just make you know pop culture normal again. Uh, because he is one of the biggest names in the space. So like Jeremy would have never apologized for interrupting if it was you know on, on a different platform. But this is Piers Morgan. Also, the fact that he did interrupt to jump in to add that extra information. Uh, it is, is good, is necessary, because the people that watch Piers Morgan might not necessarily be the people that watch Geeks and Gamers, so, like, all the extra context you can add to give yourself a sense of legitimacy to just show that you know what you're talking about, uh, and then have the, the, the courtesy to apologize after, afterwards, not bad. Well played, bud. That's a good point. Um, I want to bring in Ernest. I mean, it seems to me it's a bit like, you know, making a, another uh, Silence of the Lambs and making Hannibal Lecter a vegetarian. It's like, why would you think that's ever going to work? People want to watch it because he eats people. 
You know, I think what happened here is that there should have not been a sequel. I don't, I don't, I think that the first. This might be the first. Okay, guys, for full disclosure, I watch Pierce Morgan just about every day. I love Pierce Morgan. I don't always agree. In fact, I, I don't agree very much. Point is, I love watching Pierce Morgan. This might be the first time in the history of the show that I've ever agreed with Ernest. Holy shit. First film was dark enough. It, it had enough of the point across. Um, Joaquin Phoenix won the Oscar for Best Actor. I think that was enough, to be honest. Um, I think, I don't know what another sequel would have looked like, to be honest, if it was not this. I mean, I know this is a very polarizing film for various reasons. You know, I don't think it was, you know, as good as the first one, arguably, in the in the focus point. But I do think that a sequel of the same exact, you know, poor, lone wolf guy who's, you know, killing people... I don't know if that would have been as entertaining. Maybe it would have made more money, but it would have been, I think, artistically boring. And so I think, you know, Todd probably wants to go in a direct... Now, to be fair, the first one is artistically boring. ...of like, look, I want... I don't really want to do this, yeah, but, but if Tom, I am... Let's be honest, though. It's Tom, which is what he should have done. But Todd was completely wrong. He should have just done a lot more of the same, I would argue. I mean... Well, let me bring, I would argue... I, well, that, that I, let me bring in, I want to bring in yeah. Esther. I want to bring in Esther, because Esther... Some commentators, including Peter, actually, yeah. have suggested that by making the film a musical, by casting a gay icon, Lady Gaga, having the Joker character kiss another man in the movie, that the director, Todd Phillips, was deliberately trolling the online, online right-wing fan demo. All right. It brings up a good point. I, I'm going to give my two cents on this, specifically the Lady Gaga part. I'm not a big fan of Lady Gaga's music. That said, she is a good musician. As someone who was a musician, I can say she's objectively good at it. I love her stuff with Tony Bennett. Bro, Lady Gaga and Tony Bennett together kicks ass. A Star is Born, she is fantastic. She can sing, she can act. I, I re That was the only thing about Joker 2 that I was interested in was Lady Gaga as Harley Quinn. I think that there's a chance she could have you know, killed that slate. She could have eclipsed Margot Robbie. Now, obviously, that's not what happened. Uh, how much that was more, uh, you know, how much that was Gaga, how much that was the writing, the script, the direction. Don't know, don't care, won't ever see the movie. But I don't know... I'm not saying there weren't people out there, but I didn't hear anyone that outright rejected the movie because Lady Gaga is a gay icon. That's, a, that's, that's again, that's a leap. And if that's the way Todd Phillips is thinking, and that's the way Hollywood's thinking, oh, we'll make sure we don't get the chuds to see this movie by putting Lady Gaga in it. Homie, I'm as chuddy as you could possibly imagine by your own standards, and I think A Star is Born is one of the most brilliant movies of the last ten years, so go fuck yourself. Um, and that by doing so, ironically, of course, he's yeah. self-imploded his franchise. Well, I think, I think we're intellectualizing what's right before our very eyes, which is this was a giant tax write-off. I'm sorry, the film was so offensively bad, there is no way that this could be, to be, could be intellectualized as any other thing than a giant tax write-off. I mean, I, I watched it in, in a rural part of England, and there were people leaving the cinema halfway through. Really? It was that bad. Mm -hmm. I, don't like, I don't like musicals on the best of days, I will, I will admit my bias, but there were just so many things about it that were just it didn't make sense. Actually, the music wasn't even the worst part of it. It was the, the disjointed plot line, I mean, Joaquin Phoenix, who is an acclaimed actor, was effectively asked to make a souffle out of cow dung. It was, it was so bad. I, I just, I mean, the idea that this was a giant... Every time this chick is on the show, she is brilliant. Oh, I love... I, I think her name's Esther or something. Yeah, yeah es Esther Karake. Uh, she is so great. Middle finger to incels and the people that enjoyed the first film really don't understand what made the first film quite unique. Yes, it should have been a standalone, but I think there's something to be said about the fact that there was nothing about this that would indicate it would be commercially successful, which makes me think it was a write-off. They quadrupled the budget, they turned it into a musical, which is always a big gamble. Mm. The plot was confused, and in the end, I'm sorry, spoiler alert, the jo Joker wasn't even the Joker. So it, it really, there was no point to the film. <laughs> Bro, she out here just giving straight spoilers, because you gotta remember, this was recorded days in advance. So, like, you're seeing this now, uh, it, I recorded this yesterday because it came out yesterday. Jeremy was talking about on X how he recorded his segment for it the day before. So this is like three or four days. By the time you're seeing this, it's three or four days removed from when this is actually filmed. The, like the original Piers Morgan interview. And she's out here like, I don't give a fuck. Spoilers at the end. He's not even the real Joker. That's pretty amazing. I will say, that does fix one complaint of mine from the first film. And that, yo, how you, you, you meet like a 10-year-old Bruce Wayne. How the fuck are you going to have a 10-year-old Bruce Wayne? with this, like, 80-year-old Joker. That wouldn't make any sense when Batman grows up. So, uh, you know, fair enough for fixing it there, I guess. It had no relevance to the entire film franchise. And, and having Lady Gaga, who's very talented in there, but didn't really seem 
Like she was actually a, a embodying the character. I mean, the best parts of her in the film were just her singing. Which yeah. yes, we know Lady Gaga can sing, but you're not actually making. The but you best know, of her you know what ability. the big lesson is here. I'm sorry, this was a tax writer. I think the big lesson here is probably for uh, the Broccoli family as they work out what to do with James Bond, because <laughs> given the way Bond ended up in the last movie as a kind of neutered emasculated, sobbing guy who ends up apparently being killed. Um, if they continue to take 007 down that road, no one's going to want to watch it. You know, I want... I mean, I'll come to Jeremy for this, but the truth is, Jeremy, people want James Bond to be a cold-eyed, steely killer who womanizes, drinks and smokes, don't they? I mean, if you tamper with Spoiler the franchise too much, Hollywood. nobody wants to watch this stuff. Spoiler alert for Hollywood. Uh, fans and audiences want men to be men and women to be women. Yes. And it's that simple. Uh, yes. get it back to the Did you see homie in the middle roll his eyes at that? Like, men to be men, women to be women. Homie, eyes rolled so far in the back of his head. If he had a brain, he'd have been able to see it. Meanwhile, you got base black chick over here, Count Blackula over here, being all like, yeah, agreeing. And, oh, this is, I, I didn't even look, check to see uh, Discount Up's fucking facial reaction. To the basics that's the bottom line and this is as simple as business now before i was a, a low quality youtuber i worked in retail when i worked in retail do you know what we did when something's the self-deprecation there also really works for jeremy and before i was a low quality youtuber like again showing a little bit of a humbleness uh I, I, that that's the main reason i wanted to watch this like, like i would watch this on my own time because i'm a pierce morgan fan i want to see how jeremy handles himself because jeremy got a bit of a different personality than again critical drinker and neurotic po folks who have been on the show before uh Jer jeremy's a bit spicier and a bit dicier i mean again he's he's the one of the most pro if not the most pro trump person on all of youtube like i think that uh i think he's carrying himself real well i think that this is people he, he's gonna see a bump from this and him seeing a bump is gonna cause ripples throughout the sort of like anti-woke if you want to call that community and that's a good thing sold we ordered more of it because the audience was telling us, or the customer was telling us, we want more of this product. Well, am I supposed to go, well, I don't like your opinion, so I'm not going to order more of the Kraft macaroni and cheese. It's the dumbest thing ever. <laughs> Give people what they want. Yeah. If people are going to your movie and giving you a billion dollars for a rated R movie, a fucking rated R movie made a billion dollars, the first one in history, yeah. and what did you say? All right, now this is the Jeremy we know. He getting worked up. He dropping F-bombs. This is the Jeremy. This is the D-Day Cobra we know. Hey, all of you fans, go F yourself. We don't like you. We don't respect you. Now, to the argument of... Well, this is... This is, this is they... Yeah, I mean, this well, is ahead, what happens when, when filmmakers are... And back to being nice and measured. Don't go for a black lady. You speak. Uh, get... What a duality. This is, this is the most range I've seen from Jeremy, I think, ever. I've been watching him since, like, I don't know, fucking 2016 or 18 or something. Uh, activists instead of actual filmmakers. This is what happens when people are not concerned about c producing quality content and giving people what they want. Instead, they're there wagging their fingers at you and telling you, oh, you're naughty for liking this film that we created. That makes you an incel. Therefore, we're going to create this, this awful film that, w that people will walk out halfway through in, in rural parts of England, not diehard fans, uh, just average people that thought, oh, let me go to the cinema today. I mean, this is exactly what happens. And unfortunately, Hollywood is going to have to learn the hard lesson that if you decide to put out content that's more ideologically driven than about producing quality filmmaking, this is what happens. But there's also, I think, um, Ernest, there's a kind of deceit at the heart of this, which is this. Uh, take up the, the Rachel Zegler comments uh, last week about Snow White, which she plays Snow White. Uh, and she's Latina herself. And she defended right. the fact that she should be playing Snow White, who in the original Grimm's fairy right. tale was as white as the driven snow, was her skin color. By saying it's never been about skin color, it was always about Snow White's resistance, to which I tweeted, well, imagine if that's the case, if Daniel Craig had got the lead role as Black Panther, uh, and, I, and, and he had argued it's not about skin color, even though the original cartoon strip very much had the Black Panther as a black character. It's not about his skin color, it's about his resistance. People like you would have gone nuts and said, don't be so disgusting, of course it's about skin color. Uh, and yet, Rachel Zegler, I bet you're about to launch a ridiculously... How amazing is it that Rachel Zegler, she, I think, I don't think we give Rachel Zegler enough credit. Now, hold on, hold on, hold on. don't look what you got. Hear me out. Rachel Zegler may have single-handedly brought this sort of news and this sort of like, like level of anti-wokeness in films 
to the masses. Her her idiocy, her complete and utter screw up after screw up after screw up in the public eye reached such massive degrees that even normies were like, what's what's going on with this bitch? And it's to the point where like, everyone knows all the controversies. We all know, weird, weird. We all know. It, it was to the point where I didn't even cover the Skin is White as Snow stuff because I'm like, I'm a nerdy news channel. This isn't news. This is just Zegler being Zegler. Who hasn't heard about this at this point? It, it's... She does our job for us by accident, and that almost warrants some appreciation. Indefensible defense of her right to say it's not about skin color with Snow White, right? Well, I think also context matters, right? Um, Black Panther's origins and the origin story of where they're at, the context around the character is driven by a racialized plot that almost if you had a white Black Panther character, it wouldn't make sense. Snow White is not driven by her racial identity throughout the film. You could literally replace any person of any type of ethnicity to play it. But if you're obsessed with skin tone, then sure, if you want to be... I mean, except for the fact that there's the line, skin as white as snow. So yes, while her, her ethnicity doesn't drive the story forward, that's a very clear indication of what the character is supposed to look like. Again, I look more like Snow White than Rachel Zegler does. Very specific that the skin was white as snow and that's the only reference then sure, I guess you could argue that. But Black I mean, Panther isn't just driven name. by skin Snow color. White? It's driven by the origin <laughs> of the, uh, the identity of it, right? R African roots and tribal. Snow okay, white? so if you want to make that argument, you, you can't. Right. Right. Let, let, let me, I want to, just before I, let, before I let Peter and Jeremy go, uh, Peter, I'm going to ask you and Jeremy the same question. It, it, before this, uh, IMDB said the worst sequel of all time was Jaws 2, The Revenge, which was absolutely god-awful. <laughs> Uh, it, has it now been supplanted by this second Joker movie? No. This is not the worst sequel of all time by a long mile. In fact, it's quite a provocative Correct. movie. I just think it's a it's a it's a train wreck. It's definitely not a write off either. We've seen what Warner Brothers does to bury their movies, and you don't spend this kind of money to lose this kind of money. They thought they had a hit on their hand. I mean, didn't Warner Brothers shelve Batgirl and Supergirl films that were completed? He's, he's, if, if, if we're thinking about the same thing, he's objectively wrong there. The movies were done, and then they got shelved as write-offs. There were a number of factors that worked against it, like Joaquin having bowed out at the last minute of a Todd Haynes movie, therefore not being available for publicity. A lot of the things that would have helped them here. Uh, if I can just insert a thought, because you brought up James Bond. Yeah. You brought up kind of like, you know, casting and, and not mm. casting white people in roles we're used to. Well, you haven't even got in. me onto, onto the Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, where we're not allowed to have actual dwarf actors. I mean, that was the most... Right, right. I've heard all these arguments, and yeah. like, I'm not really interested in that, that conversation. But I would like to bring up the point. I just saw Blitz, the new Steve McQueen movie. Mm. And this movie I adored. It corrects something that I think is essential to the conversation about could you have a black James Bond? And that appears you live in the UK, not me, but like the, um, uh, my feeling is that in the history of a century of cinema, uh, people of color have been erased from, as extras from black, uh, from uh, British stories. Mm. Here is a movie that retells the story of World War II, the air raid bombings, the Blitz, and it includes all of those characters in a way that we've been deprived for a hundred years. And so, a lot of the the kind of correct, I I that we've been deprived a hundred years, homie. They've made a million awesome, amazing black movies. I mean, the the Wiz, the all-black retelling of The Wizard of Oz is great. Uh, the 90s was full of, everyone talks about how the 90s was full of diversity. And then you got the modern day iterations of it. When you got films like The American Society of Magical Negroes. Yes, I bet y'all blocked that one from your memory. That was a thing that happened. Also made less money than this Joker movie. Although I can't say I know what the budget was. But the point is this, this guy's on crack. I, I hope to God Black Chick here corrects him measures you're mm. seeing now are either restoring the diversity that exists in our world, maybe not in whatever fairy tale land something took place, but I commend Disney uh, for taking steps to sort of... Homie said he commends Disney, insta opinion in the garbage. He could, he could tell me 
it does not matter at this point what he tells me. Insta all your opinions, garbage. If you just said you command Disney, you could be like, yo, Leon, I agree with you. Goku can't beat Superman. I'd be like, no, man, you can don't, you can, with Disney? Really? really? You, you, you come into them? No, never mind, change my opinion. Superman gonna trounce Goku. Uh, embrace the fact that not all of their audience are little white boys like I was, or, you know, that everyone can find a princess to identify with, and that uh, they've been open on this. And Yeah, I was, more, me, I was more struck by, by Rachel Zegler's uh, sort of defense of herself. In relation to Bond, I'd have no problem with a black James Bond. Um, even though that you wasn't the way it was written by Inferno. In fact, I've said that I think well, I mean, Idris Elba would be I, a brilliant just, James Bond. I, uh, final word to Jerry. Can I just jump, um, pick up on something you Very said? Very quickly, yeah. Yes, yes, I would love to hear what she has to say after that diatribe of mental retardation. You said corrective measures. You said corrective measures, which I think is actually indicative of the kind of mindset of people that feel like, you know, cinema and art should take a sp specific form. Uh, why why should any sort of art have corrective measures, right? The whole point of producing art and telling a story is to just express your creativity by saying, oh, you're doing this, it's incorrect because you don't have these 20 diverse characters or you don't have a transgender one-handed -hand Muslim woman. You're, you're, you're placing constraints on art. And this is why we end up having horrible films like Joker 2, because you can't just produce what you want. You can't just express yourself. You have to have corrective measures so that some little girl in Rwanda can somehow feel identified with, with the Joker, which is ludicrous. You can't okay. always have that. Good and, point. And uh, Pete, fi uh, fi Peter, hang on, final right? word. Jeremy, I just want to ask you, is it the worst sequel of all time? Uh, no, not not the worst sequel of all time. What's I just the want worst to say, Peter for you? said uh, uh, the worst sequel of all time. Well, it depends on if you're talking about a direct sequel or uh, like The Last Jedi is probably the worst true, mm. like actual sequel uh, because of the destruction it did to Star Wars. The Joker 2, look, Todd Phillips accomplished what he wanted to accomplish. From a creative standpoint, I can appreciate that. He did accomplish what he wanted to accomplish. It's just that what he wanted to accomplish exactly. was a terrible, terrible thing. And yeah. um, so I think he did what he wanted to do. And that's the bottom line on yeah, this Yeah, I think you right may here. be right. It was, a, it was an act of self-harm. Um, I yeah. would say the two greatest sequels of all time, Godfather 2 and Top Gun Maverick. There you are. That's the Dark verdict. Knight's the greatest sequel. Um, the Dark and they were Knight's hugely the popular sequel. as a result. Because you know what? They gave you what they said on the 10 in the first one. Jeremy had to get that last bit in, had to say, no, that Dark Knight is the greatest sequel. First of all, Jeremy, you are entirely wrong. Greatest sequel of all time, Terminator 2 Judgment Day. Hop off my meat. Only with bells on. Uh, guys, thank you all very much indeed. We're going to keep two of you. Uh, Ernest and all right, well, that is, seems to be the end of that in terms of you know, Jer Jeremy's portion on the show. Uh, no, I thought that was great. I thought that he came in calm, cool, collected, measured. He was able to hold his own uh, against these, you know, hyper-intellectual, wokey types. Uh, only let one F-bomb slip. Mad props. Way to go, Jeremy. Uh, but no, I, again, the... I bet, I haven't checked, I, I don't know what his sub count was before this, I certainly don't know what it's like after this, uh, you wouldn't know, like, for just the average viewer who's watching Piers Morgan, who might not know about Jeremy, might not know about Geeks and Gamers, might not know about the D-Day Cobra channel, you wouldn't know that he is a hardcore, radical Trump supporter, because you shouldn't, that doesn't matter, and again, Jeremy makes no attempt to hide that, and I respect that about him, I kind of find it kind of boring, I've, I've, I've told him this, honestly, that, that's just not my shtick, even as a Trump supporter, uh, something's gonna be too much, but like, when it comes to his, his pop culture aspect, yeah, he's just a normal dude. He's just a normal, regular nerd who wants to see nerd shit be cool again, and I, I think that the way he carried himself and handled himself on this show with this panel... Man, that's that's going to be huge. I mean, how many views does this video have? Let's let's take a look. How many views does this have? Uh, it has got two. ninety one thousand forty eight views. So we are on the we are, we're just cresting on the hundred k mark, uh, and it's only six hours old as of the time of recording this. So like, yeah, I I think that there's going to be a myriad of individuals who had never seen Jeremy before who are now like, okay. I'm going to check him out. And checking him out might lead to Epic Mike, or might lead to The Critical Drinker, or might lead to Hypnotic, or Stuttering Craig, maybe eventually down the pipeline all the way to your boys like myself and Badger, us little guys on the totem pole. Uh, and, and, and that's going to be a massive boon for, for everyone, because again, the sense of legitimacy that it gives... We're, we're not all just some crazy, radical, right-wing rednecks that want to make every movie about supporting the Second Amendment. Like, no, homie. 
I just want to make sure that you don't turn Sonic Trans in Sonic 3, and that's really it. Like, well, that's just my opinion. Let me know yours in the comments down below, or let me know on X ring, find me at Bolt the Word. And please just subscribe. I'm a nerdy news channel. I cover nerdy news every day. Not always about what's, uh, you know, reacting to YouTubers and Piers Morgan, but anime, movies, music, Magic the Gathering, you name it. Check me out on Instagram at Words of Paradise underscore Leon, and become a member for $4.99 a month. You can join the Discord, choose the articles I go over on a day to day basis, choose the videos I react to on my Friday night live streams, and of course, get involved with over 80, no, over 130 other vital idols. We are a bright, beautiful, glowing, vibrant community that I cannot wait to grow even further because we do care about diversity. We're only one kind of diversity. Diversity of thought. If that's interesting to you, join the Discord, hit subscribe, and until next time, it is all here in the Nerdosphere. This has been Words of Paradise.